Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website and remind them that any of our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. For those in-house, we would ask if you'll check that one last time that cell phones have been turned off. It is most appreciated for those recording the room as well as those speaking. Uh, we will post the program within 24 hours on our Heritage homepage for your future reference as well. Hosting our discussion today is Cully Stimson. Cully is a senior legal fellow here at Heritage. He is also a captain in the United States Navy Reserves where he currently serves as the Deputy Chief Judge of the Navy Marine Corps Trial Judiciary. Over the last two decades, Mr. Stimson has served as a domestic violence prosecutor in the San Diego City Attorney's Office, a homicide and violent sex crimes prosecutor in Maryland, and as an assistant United States attorney here in Washington, D.C. in the homicide violent crim crimes section. During his three tours on active duty in the Navy JAG Corps, he has served two tours as a criminal defense attorney and one as a military prosecutor. He has tried over 100 jury trials, including numerous sex crimes cases. He has trained local, state, and military prosecutors, law enforcement, and safe and SART nurses on topics ranging from investigation and prosecution of rape, understanding DNA, forensic evidence, and evidence. He is also trained for the National District Attorneys Association, the National Children's Advocacy Center, and has been an adjunct professor of law at George Mason University School of Law and a senior instructor at the Naval Justice School. Please join me in welcoming Cully Stimson to our program. Thank you very much, John, and uh, thank you all for coming out on this uh, what well, was supposed to be a nice day uh, weather-wise, but uh, it's turned into a rainy uh, fall D.C. day. <clears throat> this is a tough topic to talk about. It's one that uh, we hope will be conducted today in terms of our dis discussion in a, um, a forthright and honest and direct and respectful way, and we look forward to your questions at the end of our discussion. Sexual assault in the military and outside of the military is a real problem. As Americans, uh, we are all appalled when we hear about rape in the military because we expect our service personnel to be law-abiding. Military sexual assault has a uniquely greater damaging effect on the military such that even one incident is unacceptable. And incidents of sexual assault are detrimental to morale, destroy unit cohesion, so disrespect for the chain of command, and damage the military as a whole, both internally as well as externally. Obviously, it harms the victim. Service members are trained for situations in which it is essential to trust both enlisted members of the unit and the chain of command completely. Sexual assault in the military destroys that trust, which can detract and does detract from the readiness of our armed forces. So, what can be done to address this problem in the military so that victims of crime and those accused of crime get justice? We answer that question in our new special report and do so by examining the facts, which I will highlight now, and suggest that before Congress makes any changes whatsoever, that they take stock of those facts and our conclusions. Fact one, the military exists to defend the nation. That is its mission. To accomplish that mission, leaders must ensure that those who serve under them are combat ready, and if ordered into armed combat, combat effective. Maintaining good order and discipline in the armed forces is essential to accomplishing that mission. Our military justice system is integral to the military's mission. It is unique and for good reason. Unlike the civilian justice system where we've all practiced, the military justice system exists, uh, excuse me, unlike the, military, under, unlike the civilian justice system, which exists solely to enforce the laws of the jurisdiction and punish wrongdoers, our military justice system exists in order to help the military succeed in its mission to defend the nation. 
It is structured so that those in charge, commanding officers, can carry out the orders of their civilian leaders. Now, there are some in Congress who apparently don't understand this, the difference in mission, and they dangerously conflate the two systems. Fact two. Commanding officers in the military have a wide range of tools available to enforce good order and discipline. You're going to hear from a former commanding officer, a retired rear admiral, later. Those tools include mild administrative remedies, such as informal counseling, formal counseling, executive officer inquiry, non-judicial punishment under Article 15 of the UCMJ. But the ultimate remedy for any commanding officer is the power to immediately refer a suspected criminal in her chain of command to a court-martial. Taking that power away from commanding officers, the scheme that Senator Gillibrand has proposed, eliminates an indispensable authority that cannot be delegated or transferred to another if we are to demand accountabilities from commanders for prosecuting and preventing sexual assaults and other serious crimes. This notion of accountability to one's commanding officer may seem mysterious to civilians who have never served in the armed forces, but chain of command and accountability up and down the chain of command is essential to carrying out the missions as ordered by the president, whose authority as commander-in-chief owes accountability to the people via elections and assures a military that will not threaten our constitutional democracy. In the words of a retired service member who testified before the Senate, quote, don't take the authority away from command. Let's look at processes that can support commanders, unquote. Or, as Senator Claire McCaskill said, quote, the best way to protect victims and realize more aggressive and successful prosecutions is by keeping the chain of command in the process at the beginning of a criminal proceeding, unquote. Fact three. The Gillibrand scheme is not pro-victim. If her scheme were to become law, two things would happen, as our paper demonstrates. One, fewer sexual assaults would be sent to court-martial. Why? Because convening authorities, non-lawyer line officers, only need probable cause to send someone to a court-martial for sexual assault. And as you know, probable cause means reasonable, reason to believe that a crime occurred. It's a very low, in fact, it's the lowest standard in the law. If the Gillibrand scheme were to become law, military prosecutors alone would make the charging or referral decision. They will only file cases, just like their civilian counterparts would, if they can prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, the highest form of proof in the law. That means fewer cases would actually go to court-martial, not more. And the second reason it's not pro-victim is that it relieves commanders the very person most responsible for enforcing good order and discipline in her unit from being accountable when sex assault occurs in her command. Fact four, the Gillibrand scheme is sold as cost neutral to lure other people onto her amendment. But as we discuss in our paper, it will not only cost a lot of money, it will result in a huge disruption of JAGs currently in non-litigation billets being pulled into the role of chief prosecutor. Do you think that those admirals and generals who currently have 06s, JAGs rec uh, giving them legal advice are going to not want a replacement? Of course not. Fact five. Training about sexual assault across, sexual assault across the armed forces is key and should continue. It's not the sole panacea, but it must remain. We highlight not only general military training given by the armed forces over the years on this topic in our paper, but we also note that over the last five years, on average, the military has recruited 165,644 civilians onto active duty in the armed forces. That's a high turnover rate. The majority of those are young men and women, the very same young men and women who need to be trained about this topic. Six, the training given by the service JAGs to military prosecutors and defense counsel is on par with the training given to their career civilian district attorneys and public defenders, and one panelist will argue may be superior to that training they get. We highlight the training that's available publicly and pull it together in one place 
that, took, that has taken place from 1997 all the way to 2012. In addition to those facts, we also make some in-depth observations relevant to the current debate. One, the last time Congress tried to fix the issue of sexual assault in the military back in 2006, they actually make matters worse. They amended the rape statute in a way to make it easier for prosecutors to convict and harder for defense counsel to mount a constitutional defense. And ultimately, a federal court deemed their scheme unconstitutional. It resulted in a huge disruption and unnecessary litigation in the armed forces. They did this against the advice of subject matter experts, but they did it anyway. A lesson for this time around. Number two, our paper highlights each major House, Senate, and executive branch proposal in detail and talks about how it would help or hurt the process of improving the criminal justice system overall. Three, we discuss in detail why the Gillibrand scheme actually puts victims at risk and weakens the military justice system as a whole. As Senator McCaskill and Representative Loretta Sanchez a sex crimes victim, by the way, recently concluded in a USA Today op-ed, the Gillibrand scheme is, quote, a risky approach for victims. This is their words, not ours. A risky approach for victims, one that would increase the risk of retaliation, weaken our ability to hold commanders accountable, and lead to fewer prosecutions, unquote. Next, we surveyed best practices in big city district attorney and public defender offices, all of which we've been in, to see how they train their attorneys and groom them for the most serious cases like rape, child abuse, and homicide. We compare those best practices to those employed by all the services JAGS Corps and conclude that the JAG Corps measures up well in the training department, but fails to measure up in one sense, the lack of career tracks for military lawyers tasked with prosecuting and defending these difficult cases. Let me conclude with a story and then I'll introduce our outstanding panelists. <clears throat> Before I, over 20 years ago, while I was in law school, I was a student prosecutor here in the D.C. area in a local state's attorney's office. And during that time, because the local rules allowed it, I've tried over 40 misdemeanor bench trials. Simple stuff. DUIs, DWIs, simple theft, assault and battery, etc. Fast forward a couple years later. I'm now a member of the bar. I'm a baby first lieutenant, or well, lieutenant in my first tour in the JAG Corps, and I had earned the rank of the number one lieutenant in the command as a prosecutor. And so naturally, when the rape case came aboard the command, it was given to me. Five victims, one defendant, dozens of witnesses, DNA, fingerprint evidence, polygraph evidence, a very complicated case. Now, I won that case. Um, but not because I was a skilled prosecutor. I wasn't ready for that case. Now, justice was done because he was guilty, and that's what the court found. Fast forward more than a decade later, after 100 trials under my belt, most of which were outside the military because I'd left active duty, I was an assistant United States attorney in the homicide major crime section here in the District of Columbia. We had a sex assault attempted murder case. Four of my colleagues had rejected the case. Four assistant U.S. attorneys in the division had rejected the case. Why? She was a prostitute. She was in a coma. She was in a drug addict. And she didn't report the crime for months. And the defendant, her so-called boyfriend, had cleaned up the crime scene. He Clorox bleached the walls, got rid of the blood, painted over the walls, and told everyone to shut up. 
But because of that experience that I'd had, the type of experience you'll hear from momentarily from these excellent advocates, I knew it was a case worth trying. And so we investigated it. We brought in the Secret Service forensic detail uh, uh, unit. We exploited the crime scene, which I wouldn't have known how to do as a JAG. We took up the floorboards of the apartment. And between the grooves of the wood, we found blood, her blood. Underneath the paint, underneath the Clorox bleach, we found her blood, which, co which corroborated her statement that he'd hit her with a blunt object numerous times about her head, which caused her head to be split open and why she was in a coma. We also exploited a number of other forensic techniques, including forensic odontology, bite mark evidence, nothing I really knew much about. We won. Justice was done. He was found guilty. Actually, he pled guilty because the evidence in the investigation was so thorough. And he received a sentence above the sentencing guidelines, which was unique here in the District of Columbia. The same person, the same type of JAG that I was, eager, aggressive, is the type of person they recruit in the JAG court today. These are patriots. They're hardworking. They're eager to take cases. But one of the major conclusions in our paper, besides keeping the convenient authority in the business of referring cases to ensure good order and discipline, is for the services to create litigation tracks. So that lieutenant, who should have been trying misdemeanors for the first five, six years, will be able to become that commander or that lieutenant colonel trying that really hard case when he's ready or she's ready. And it also is unfair. It, it, victims deserve no less in the military. A military victim of a crime is no different than a victim outside the military of a crime. They deserve career, professional prosecutors. And those accused of crime in the military are no different than those accused outside. They deserve the Kate Coins of the world. People who have tried hundreds and hundreds of cases, not are thrown into courts martial allowed to try cases for one, two, or two, and then leave. So our conclusions are clear. The commander must retain the authority to enforce good order and discipline in her command, and thus may re must retain the ability to refer cases to court martial. And there are modest improvements that can be made to the criminal justice system, some of which have merit, which we discuss in our paper. But the long-term structural change that can take place tomorrow if the services decide to do so, the Navy already has, is to establish career tracks that make sense for their service to give victims, world-class experienced prosecutors who have the experience to handle these tough cases, and world-class defense counsel so that defendants accused of these horrible crimes can have the Kate Coins and the top-notch public defenders of the world. And with that, let me um, introduce our panelists. Um, all three are good friends of mine. In fact, Kate tried cases against my wife many, many years ago uh, when my wife was a DA in San Diego. Pat uh, and I go way back, and Paul and I have trained together. Uh, and Paul is also the author, Pat, if you could hold up his book, uh, of Sexual Assault Trials, which is his third edition by LexisNexis. Pat McGrath uh, will be our first speaker. He graduated from the Naval Academy in 1979 and earned his wings as a naval aviator, shortly thereafter flying helicopters off of Navy ships. He was on active duty for 11 years, and while on active duty, he got his law degree. He left active duty and joined the DA's office in San Diego in 1992, where he remains to this day. During his career there, he has tried cases in juvenile, misdemeanor, and the felony trial sections, eventually making his way to and then running the Family Protection Division, which handles rapes, child abuse, child homicide, and sex crimes. He continued his military career as a reservist, uh, retiring as a rear admiral last October after 33 years of distinguished naval service, including commanding six active and reserve organizations, including as the deputy commander of U.S. Third Fleet. In other words, he's been a convening authority. Pat will divide his time between discussing the unique role of the convening authority in the military and his role uh, and the role he had, and then switched to the topic of best practices in big city DA offices. Kate will follow Pat.
Kate has had a distinguished career in as a public defender, uh, which she has done for the last 31 years. She's been in four separate offices. She's tried hundreds of bench trials and jury trials, and she recently retired from the San Diego Public Defender's Office as a senior trial deputy, where she handled the most serious cases, including sex assault, mass murder, serial murder, and death penalty cases. She has won numerous awards for her brilliant and tireless work as a public defender, including being named California Defender of the Year and San Diego Defense Bar Association Trial Attorney of the Year. She's the daughter of a Marine, and she retired from the public defender's office earlier this year and now accepted a position uh, as a HQE, highly qualified expert, to the United States Marine Corps Defense Services Organization as a civilian. She reports directly to the Chief Defense Counsel to the Marine Corps and provides expert advice on sexual assault and other complex cases to Marine Judge Advocates. Kate today will be speaking about the military justice system and how it compares to its civilian counterpart from a defense perspective. She will also offer her opinion on how a career track for defense counsel in the military justice system will improve the system as a whole, among other recommendations. And last but not least is my friend Paul Deranessian, who served as an assistant district attorney for 22 years in the Albany County DA's office, where he oversaw a special assault unit responsible for investigation and prosecution of all sex assault, child abuse, domestic violence, and child homicide cases. Today, Paul is in private practice representing sex assault and crime victims and is a consultant to the investigation and trials of sex assault, child abuse, domestic violence, and child homicide cases. Paul is a nationally recognized writer and lecturer on sexual assault, child abuse, and child homicides. He's the author of Sexual Assault Trials. Uh, he also is a contributing author and editor to the, quote, Manual for the Investigation and Prosecution of Child Abuse, National Center for Prosecution of Child Abuse and Neglect, and author of Establishing Victim Credibility in Acquaintance Rape Cases, published by the Practical Prosecutor in 1998. He's taught extensively throughout his career to include the National College of District Attorneys, the APRI, which is American Prosecutors Research Institute, National Center for the Prosecution of Child Abuse and Neglect, and the nationally recognized San Diego International Conference on Child and Family Maltreatment, including teaching federal and law enforcement uh, agencies. And when I ran the Prosecuting Complex and Capital Litigation course at the Naval Justice School for several years, Paul was one of my guest lecturers and a favorite among JAGs. I've asked him to talk about why sexual assaults in general are difficult to include specialized areas of law and knowledge involved, and he will address how a career track will better serve victims and defendants and how it enhances the reliability of those particular judgments. I'll turn it over to Pat McGrath. Thanks, Cully. You can do it from there or up here, Pat. Um, I think I'll go up there. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, thanks, Cully, for the uh, uh, invitation to speak here. Uh, as Cully mentioned, for the past 20 years, I have lived parallel lives in the San Diego District Attorney's Office and with multiple U.S. Navy commands. Because of those two careers, I've often had to live the dividing line between general criminal law and military law. Frequently, I would be conflicted because of two different processes and standards between the systems, both of which I believe, though not perfect, are fair and generally successful. With that in mind, I will discuss two of the specific recommendations listed in the Heritage Paper. Then I'll give you my overall impression as both a prosecutor and a retired naval officer as to where I see the military is with sexual assault in the military and some recommendations I have. I believe that we should not take away convening authority from commanders. Heritage lists a number of reasons supporting keeping a, a, a convening authority with commanders. I will give you mine. If you take away convening authority, the number of people prosecuted for sexual assault will go down. I have no doubt about this. As a prosecutor, my standard for proof for filing charges in San Diego is that I believe that I could prove a case to, beyond, to a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a very high standard, and I believe it is appropriately a high standard. 
As a commanding officer, my standard was that I had probable cause to believe a crime was committed and the person committed the crime. That is similar to the standard that most police departments use for, for, for a simple arrest. The gap between those two standards is huge. The reason the standard is lower in the military is because of the necessity to maintain good order and discipline in the commands. When I was not in the DA's office, okay, so when I was on active duty and I was reviewing as a military officer and not as a JAG, disciplinary proceedings for my personnel, I would often have to consciously remind myself that I am not using my prosecutor's standard because many of the cases that I saw would never have been charged in the civilian side of the house. So if one thinks that taking away convening authority and putting it in the hands of a military prosecutor will increase accountability and punishment, I'm here to tell you that that is an incorrect premise. Secondly, I mentioned the word accountability. As it stands now with convening authority uh, and responsibility in the hands of commanders, there is no doubt as to who is responsible for the decision-making process. The commander. With responsibility comes accountability. Commanders are very, right now very aware of the national level interest in sexual assault in the military. There's an old Navy saying, what interests my boss absolutely fascinates me. Taking convening authority away from commanders will lessen their authority and also divorce them from the responsibility for the charging decision. It would move that decision out of the chain of command to a prosecutor, thus further eroding a line of responsibility and therefore a line of accountability for that decision. Uh, the Heritage Paper discussed career track. As a prosecutor, looking at the various service systems of producing trial attorneys, I believe that they all should embrace specialization. A very good start is the Navy career litigator track, where young JAG officers are targeted to trial litigator tracks. Sexual assault cases, like domestic violence and child abuse cases, are very difficult to prosecute and requires years of practice to develop an expertise. In San Diego, as a deputy district attorney, I would often, often have conversation with military commanders who would ask if they could prosecute through the military system a case that I had on my desk in the Family Protection Division of the District Attorney's Office. I usually just said simply that, look, we've already got the case. I've got someone assigned. It would be inefficient and difficult to transfer the case from my system to yours. I did not say, however, to anyone that I had right to my right down the hallway 20 seasoned trial attorneys who did nothing but domestic violence, child molest for years. And I did not feel confident that the commander's young JAG officers had the level of experience and level of expertise that I had ready to me because in my shop I had people that had done 10 years of domestic violence and child abuse and sex cases. Okay, these are my thoughts on the two major discussion points in the Heritage Paper. I'd now like to give you some just general thoughts about sexual assault in the military. Okay, first of all, we are not just going to be able to prosecute our way out of this issue. We have to do more than just concentrate on the punishment end if we're going to hope to prevent sexual assault. On August 15th, the DOD proposed changes to improve victim support, strengthen pretrial investigation, and enhance oversight. These are all worthy recommendations that should improve the system and should be carefully looked at. The second thing I want to remind everybody is the environment that we're talking about out here. We say sexual assault in the military. Generally, we're talking to 18 to 25-year-old people that are all patriots. They all volunteer to jo join the service. They're away from home for the first time. They're negotiating regular relationships, sexual relationship, work relationships, and I, I said away from home, and then you add alcohol into this mix, and it is a very volatile situation in a lot of respects. I just went to my son, my son is a freshman at Colorado University at Boulder, and when I went to Parents Weekend, they had a very long discussion about alcohol and the sexual assault issue, okay? Colorado makes sure they have a police department that prosecutes these cases, but they put a lot of value into training and having conversations about this, and I think that's very important. If we focus just on the prosecution end, and I'm a prosecutor, Essentially what we're doing is if you, have a, if you have a road that goes over a cliff and it's a sharp turn and you keep having cars go over that cliff, well, you can keep dealing with the bodies at the bottom, at the bottom of that cliff, but maybe you ought to think about talking to drivers about slowing down, putting up a sign, and maybe putting up a guardrail. 
So I think the training part of that and having conversations with people is very, very important and that we not solely concentrate on you know, how we can put as many people as jail as soon as possible. Because I think if we can prevent these cases, we'll be doing, we'll be doing a, a good service to both the victims and the other people in the military. Okay, our young military people, and they are young, they need guidance, scenario-based training, and attention. We need every level of supervision of the military to be conversant on these issues and make it a regular part of mentoring. As I told many CEOs, um, you know, if, as a commanding officer, if I went to a commanding officer or a ship or a squadron and I said, what's the most dangerous time for your personnel? What they will say is, either in combat or some high-tempo operation, okay, but when they go to combat and when they go to some high-tempo operation, they plan for it for months. They work up it for it for months. They review every contingency. And what I would tell the CEOs, the most dangerous time for your personnel is Friday night between 10 p.m. and Sunday morning at 10 a.m., okay? And you have to plan for that. You have to have contingencies. You have to have a backup plan. You have to have cab ride home. You have to have a wingman. We have to talk to these people about this because we need to help prevent some of these cases. Okay, another component of this has got to be survivor support. And I say survivor rather than victim because in some ways I've been socialized by a lot of victims that they have lived through this and they will go forward. And that's why I refer to them as survivors. Regardless of whether a case can that can be or will be prosecuted, support for survivors has to be built into the entire process from the initial responder, the first police officer on the scene, to the investigator, command, and the trial process. We cannot allow people who have survived an assault to be further damaged by the process, whether the case gets prosecuted or not. Lastly, we need to make sure that our cases are fully and fairly investigated and the system operates with transparency. We cannot allow a genuine concern about sexual assault problems to change the system so that any allegation is charged without an investigation, that suspicion equals guilt, or that the fairness of the process is co-opted in order to avoid making difficult decisions. As I stated before, I believe the military criminal justice system serves its purpose well. There are improvements that can be made that would make the system better, including adapting a career litigator track and many of the DOD proposals. I do not believe that taking convening authority away would be one of those improvements. Uh, I'd like to thank the Heritage Foundation for helping, helping to stimulate the conversation on this very important topic, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Cully and the Heritage Foundation for um, inviting me. And I, I'd like to start out with some kind of basic history. Um, our Constitution actually says, and these are the words, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In addition, it says, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall have the assistance of counsel for his defense. The same document which guarantees us the, the great rights, the Bill of Rights, um, that was so vigorously upheld and that our uh, armed forces are fighting right now to preserve in places as far away as Afghanistan, stand as a bulwark against the might of the government when it's ranged against an individual in a criminal prosecution. Did our founding fathers institute these rights because they were soft on crime, bleeding heart liberals? No. Historically, they were instituted because they saw at first hand what a government oppression would look like if you didn't have these rights. They were lately engaged in a historic revolution and they wanted to preserve it to their posterity. We are their posterity. And we owe it to the service members who spent their lives defending this country and its constitution, including those now fighting in Afghanistan, not to lightly give up these protections or abdicate these responsibilities. Both the Constitution and the Uniform Code of Military Justice contemplate a balanced and fair approach to the adjudication of crime. Article 46 of the Uniform Code codifies this. Military justice is different in procedure than its civilian counterpart, but it requires the same strict application of the presumption of innocence, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, and the Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel. 
However, what I don't hear mentioned very often, and I think bears repeating, is that the military justice system, you do not have a jury of 12 individuals. You do not have a unanimous verdict. In a court's martial, as few as two out of a total of three members can find a Marine guilty of crimes which carry lifelong consequences, including dishonorable and bad conduct discharges, lifetime registration as a sex offender, and may expose an individual to SVP treatment in the civilian world. The Marine, Defense, the Marine Corps Defense Services Organization Creed says, and I quote, we selflessly perform our duties with the utmost integrity, motivation, and pride without fear of reprisal or expectation of professional or personal gain. I've spent 31 years as a public defender's office in three states and in federal court. I have been privileged to work with some of the most accomplished, finest criminal def defense attorneys in the country. And I can assure you that the dedicated personnel of the Defense Services Organization yield to no one in their passion or their zeal, their commitment to the individual accused, or their devotion to defending the Constitution one client at a time. However, what they notably lack is litigation experience and adequate resources to, the, to do the job that we have tasked them with. This has been made painfully obvious by the recent disproportionate resourcing of prosecution of sexual assault allegations. Recent DOD-wide initiatives to address sexual assault have added weight exclusively to the prosecution side of the scale. The Sexual assault victims advocates, sexual assault response team centers, prosecution complex trial teams, and a vi victim's legal counsel stood up at the expense of at least one member of the Marine Defense Bar. The DSO was already opposed by four vast legal services support teams. They control resources, personnel, Access to experts and investigators and their mission includes the prosecution of crime. The ramp up uh, of additional resources without a corresponding increase in either manpower or budget for the Defense Services Organization imperils the fair and efficient administration of justice. Military justice is a tripod consisting of the prosecution, the defense, and the convening authority. When one leg of the stool is dramatically out of balance with the other, the whole system is going to topple. With the power and might of both the convening authority and the prosecution ranged against an individual service member, we must be particularly vigilant that the defense leg of the tripod is effectively reinforced to counterbalance the pressure. Let me be clear. I am not saying that such allegations should not be fully investigated and where appropriate referred to a court martial and tried, nor am I saying that individuals who are tried and convicted should not be sentenced. What I am saying is that an equally grave concern must be that in our zeal to respond to this problem, we do not convict the innocent through a failure to ensure that their counsel have both the skills and the tools needed to ensure a transparent, just, and accurate result. A military trial, any trial, can never be a mere formality on the way to conviction and punishment. The average litigation experience of both senior defense counsel and defense counsel in the uh, Defense Services Organization of the Marine Corps is 14 months. This includes both prosecution and defense experience. A recent hard-fought reorganization has set the expected time duration of a DSO litigation criminal defense billet at 18 months. We typically get these young counsel with zero experience. Um, our practice is one where we are constantly dealing with turnover. We normally start at zero, we train them up till about 15 months, and at the 15 month mark, we stop assigning them cases. 
because they're about to be transferred to another assignment. Oftentimes, that assignment is not a litigation assignment. While the Marine Corps is a smaller force which presents challenges to creating an exclusive litigation track, placing greater institutional value on high quality litigation experience, which only can be achieved through dedicated experience, is key. Forty years ago, in a paper in the American Scientist, Herbert Simon and William Chase drew one of the most famous conclusions in the study of expertise. It's kind of a simple idea. Complex activities take many years to master because they require a very long list of situations and possibilities and scenarios be experienced and processed. In his book, Outliers, social scientist Malcolm Gladwell's research indicated that mastery in a field requires approximately 10,000 hours of practice. Calculated out, that's 40 hours a week over five years. By contrast, um, no, def no military judge advocate is given five years of 40 hours a week practice. By contrast, as a public defender, in my first five years of practice, I had tried over 500 bench trials, I had tried over 20 jury trials, and I had done well over 1,000 preliminary hearings. Establishing a litigation track within the Marine Corps would greatly expand the ability of Marine judge advocates to acquire the necessary skills and master them. But there are other items that hamper the effective delivery of defense services. Uh, and I think the most pressing of that is a lack of a dedicated investigative defense resource. Congress has provided investigators for the adequate representation of federal indigent defenders. The American Bar Association has established minimum standards for investigators in the criminal justice context, and virtually every state and federal public defender's office has in-house investigators. This certainly accords with my 31 years of empirical experience and observation. In each of the four public defender's offices where I have worked, urban and rural, state and federal, the investigators formed an integrable part of the defense resources. In San Diego County, the primary public defender's office has 160 attorneys and 36 investigators. The federal defender of San Diego has 61 attorneys and 16 investigators. The central branch alone of the primary public defender's office in San Diego has 80 attorneys and 16 investigators. By contrast, the DSO has 80 attorneys and no investigators whatsoever. In the military, where the government prosecutor has full access to NCIS, CID, frequently civilian law enforcement, the defense has no independent access to defense investigation resources. Instead, in each case, the, the defense attorney must ask the prosecutor prosecuting the case for permission to hire a civilian investigator. Upon refusal, which is routine, defense counsel must file and litigate a motion before a military judge. This unnecessarily consumes both defense and prosecution and court time on unnecessary litigation that is better spent in substantive litigation. It also delays the point at which the defense can begin investigating the case and shortens the effective length of the investigation, putting them much behind their uh, prosecutorial counterparts in the preparation of their cases. Based on my experience, the most efficient and cost-effective way to provide for defense services would be simply to create a, a defense billet within the Marine Corps or each branch's CID unit. As a normal progression of duty assignment within the, the CID, there are four defense regions uh, for the Marine Corps. If each of those four regions had just two investigators, that would be half the number 
of corresponding public defender's office. But the efficiency and effectiveness and the accuracy of the results would be enhanced by an order of magnitude. And as a beneficial byproduct, a CID defense investigation billet would enhance the training and experience of CID investigators and their career progression. A second major concern in the defense of criminal charges in the military justice system is the lack of a subpoena process for the defense. Although the Constitution guarantees compulsory process to a criminal defendant or accused to secure witnesses and evidence, under the UCMJ, the defense, unlike federal defenders and most state systems, has no subpoena power. Any evidence obtained by subpoena has to be requested from the prosecution who decides whether or not he will issue the subpoena and then gets first look at the evidence, only turning it over to the defense at his leisure. In order to secure witnesses for trial, the defense must proffer to the government prosecutor a detailed summary of everything it expects the witness to say and if the government doesn't agree with the, the calling of the witness, if the government feels it's cumulative, it can arbitrarily decide not to issue the subpoena. The government does not have the contents of its subpoenas uh, returned to the defense, and it does not have to make a proffer of testimony to the defense about witnesses it wants to subpoena or documents it seeks. In fact, the prosecution or the command can simply refuse to fund necessary travel for witnesses, which is a great concern in a system where by its nature, witnesses are often by the time of trial in far-flung distant locations. If the court, if a military judge finally orders the issuance of a subpoena, a federal marshal may arbitrarily refuse to enforce it. I've been asked as an expert in criminal defense to give my opinion on improvement of the military justice system with regard to sexual assault. It's my opinion, both as a criminal defense attorney, as a citizen, and as a woman, that a fair investigation and prosecution coupled with a vigorous, equally resourced defense is the best guarantee of justice for all the stakeholders in the system. The establishment of a career military litigation track, standing up a dedicated defense investigative unit, and reform of the military subpoena process to include the ability of defense counsel to issue subpoenas in personam and subpoenas deuces taken with an effective mechanism for enforcement are modest reforms, well within the capability of Congress, but they will yield major results. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Paul? It's uh, my pleasure, privilege, and what I want to do, which is to uh, address sexual assault. That's what I do. I've spent uh, over 30 years in the field. And Mr. Stimson's paper is entitled Understanding sexual, uh, sexual Assault and What to Do About It. And I submit to you, if you don't understand what the problem is, it makes no difference who makes the decision whether to charge someone if the case is not properly handled. And in my experience, the biggest threat to successful and effective sexual assault prosecution is the lack of professionalism in the field, whether it's civilian or military. Look, you wouldn't have someone graduate from medical school and say, great, you're a doctor now, go operate. Go do orthopedic surgery, go do brain surgery. We expect and require our physicians to have a certain level of training and experience before they take on complex medical procedures. And that's what we should be looking for in the field of sexual assault. As I said, the biggest threat to the successful handling of these cases is the lack of professionalism, which I'll define for you where that comes from, what's required for professionalism. And that's why I'm so interested in, in the concept of career litigation tracks. That's something that you see in the civilian sector. 
not all over, but in, the, in significant offices that are successful in sexual assault prosecution. There are many reasons why experienced lawyers are essential to the process. One is learning about the crime, learning about the skills required, sort of the mechanics, what you expect, as I said, surgeons to learn, but there's more. One thing we know about sexual assault and people who work in it, whether they're investigators, victim advocates, or lawyers involved in the cases, it's stressful. When the FBI looked at who was most stressed out among their agents, it turned out it was those working undercover organized crime and those working in the area of sexual assault. There's an additional level of stress involved in these cases. That's why many people leave the field. You need to develop a support structure. You need, like many issues, to, as I said, to understand what the problem is and what the pressures are. By working with trained professionals, you understand that, you deal with it, and hopefully grow and develop from it. You don't work 30 years in this field and survive and be here to talk about it if you don't acknowledge those stresses. So you develop a personal confidence, too, professionally in dealing with these cases. That's one thing when you meet lawyers who've worked this area in prosecutor's office who have experience. They have a confidence level in their decision-making process, which is very important. And you have a public confidence in the decision-making process also. And public confidence can only arise when you have professionals making the decisions to prosecute as well as go to court and litigate these cases, both from a prosecution point of view and from defense point of view. So I submit to you that experience, litigation experience, is essential to understand the crime as well as dealing with the demands and stresses of sexual assault trials. And if you don't deal with that issue, you don't solve anything in this debate. Now, let me give you some examples uh, of, of where and why it's important to have some background and expertise in this area. Something that a young lawyer, and I deal with many fine young lawyers, both in the civilian and military sector, when I give this lecture, to young prosecutors, the one that Kali was talking about, one of the things I start with is, what is a sex crime? And you're probably saying, why am I here on a Thursday afternoon? Didn't we at least have that problem decided, what's a sex crime? No. Because do you know that what is a sex crime has changed from the day that I started? I mean, when I started, using a foreign object for sexual gratification wasn't a sex crime. It's now classified. And what we tend to do is look simply at what's called a sex crime under the penal law as as a sex crime. But what about somebody who stabs a woman to get sexually aroused? Is that a sex crime? Well, technically it's not. But if you can identify that, it may help you investigate it and prosecute to get the information you need. If a man enters the room of a woman or a child at night and does nothing, does it make a difference whether he's looking for money or looking for some sort of sexual arousal? It may be charged simply as a burglary, but understanding and knowing where to look to develop information, where to investigate, how to question, can make all the difference in the world in getting a fair and effective result. And that's what we want. We want a system, a legal system, that produces fair and just results across the board. And that requires experience. There's many other, you know, unique aspects of trying these cases which involve the reluctance of victims to testify. And that's one of the most frustrating things, whether you're a doctor taking a history or an investigator or a lawyer, is that you interview people who, who may not want to see someone prosecuted. Now, if you understand the dynamics of this crime, you understand that's to be expected. But it's frustrating when you have no background in this field, no training and experience to deal with reluctant victims and witnesses. Many trial techniques, uh, whether it's ex expert testimony, the cross-examination of a sexual assault defendant, requires tremendous skill. It's not just did you break into the house. 
understanding much as a counselor would. I've learned as much from counselors on how to interview victims and cross-examine defendants as I have lawyers because the lawyers who did the training didn't have that background. It was the therapists who worked with victims and defendants who gave me the idea, ask him, where's the mutuality in that relationship in what he's describing? Now, you don't learn that in your first or second year. You learn it by many years of experience. And finally, what's needed to communicate. We must communicate to individuals, whether it's a judge, whether it's a jury, and individuals who don't necessarily understand the dynamics of sexual assault, what is at work here. That's another reason we need experience. Look, when you deal with myths, one area of law that has so many myths is sexual assault, whether it's that victims don't run and tell, that victims will hate their offenders, if you're dealing with a victim who's going to go back to that offender, you have to understand the dynamics, that there's a reason why they may not want to come forward and cooperate. You need the experience to know how to deal with that. When that individual, I tell young lawyers and people who want to prosecute this area, there's one thing I've learned that you won't find in any book, including mine, and I can't prove it, but the one thing I've learned is people just don't wake up one day, go out, and rape. There's a history. So if you think that individual who, who exposed himself at the top of the elevator, stabbed that woman and got aroused somehow, doesn't have a history, you're wrong. You have to look. And if you don't look, you don't see. But when you look, you'll find a pattern of events in that person's life that explains what they did and why they did it, that helps communicate to the jury and leads you to a fair and just result. And of course, there's many rules specialized now, as legislatures have dealt with issues of specialized hearsay rules, those things lend themselves to in, in classroom training, but still best to have experience. I could go on and on, um, obviously, when you've spent as much time as I have, I can tell you about some of the unique areas, but I want to tell you about what some of the benefits are of what I think is adequately and very well addressed in this paper, the benefits of having um, increased professionalism and increased uh, career litigation tracks and how that can help deal with this problem. First of all, you have better service to victims and defendants. And I think Kate did a great job telling you what some of the challenges are from a defense point of view. The point is that adequate resources, trained professionals give better service. I told you that individuals involved in the field will have increased comfort in dealing with victims and the defendants. And very important is it is the experienced person who can help lead and train others whether it's the young attorney. You know, training isn't just what we do in the classroom. I think that's essential. Training is sitting with somebody at a table and helping them with what they're doing, critiquing them afterwards. You need to be experienced to critique a young attorney, just like you need to be a senior surgeon supervising that young assistant in the operating room. So if we accept and I tell you that training is more than just a classroom experience. It requires experience. Who's going to do it if we don't have some type of career path that produces those individuals in the military or civilian sector? It's lacking. We need to have those individuals who can do that type of training. And it provides built-in technical assistance within the organization who can assist others and whoever is going to make this decision, whether it's a commander or someone else, you have trained individuals who can facilitate and advise with confidence, with expertise, the decision on which cases to bring and what charges to bring. As I said, it's much more than a decision over who's going to make that decision. And this will also, I think, from a military point of view, provide another career path and motivate uh, military prosecutors and give them enhanced skills. What I've seen over and over, both from the office I came from as well as other civilian offices, those who can handle these cases become much more valuable individuals as lawyers within their organizations. It is a lot easier when they gave me the convenience store homicide to prosecute than in many of the rape cases I prosecuted. The crime was easily established, easy for a jury to understand. Dealing with the dynamics of these crimes are much more challenging, which not only requires expertise, but gives us the benefit, I think, of much more experienced litigators for our organization. Um, the military has one advantage over the civilian sector, and I th it has a couple of advantages, and that is 
it has the ability to implement these types of policies more easily. The training I do is these attorneys are ordered to go to training. They must do certain things. You can ensure a uniformity when it comes to professionalism and skill set. So you have an unusual opportunity that you can't mandate across the United States that civilian prosecutors engage in some of the programs that we're saying would be helpful. But in the military, you can. And my experience, a greater percentage of military attorneys receive the training they need to be effective attorneys, but that's not enough. You must build on that, and litigation is specialized in itself. Sexual assault litigation is further specialized, and that's what needs attention. And I believe that the career litigation track helps address one of the problems that we have in sexual assault in the military. Thank you. So we're going to uh, gladly turn it over to you uh, who uh, are here. Uh, I know several organizations are represented, um, not only from the military, but from victims' rights groups um, and other organizations. And I would just ask a simple uh, protocol uh, request of you, and that is to, when you're handed the mic, uh, identify yourself by name and also your organization, and then ask a question. Uh, either to the group as a whole or to an individual. And while um, you're thinking about your question, let me uh, take the prerogative as the moderator to, and the host to just ask the first question. Um, you know, the Marine Corps has um, hired uh, civilian, highly, quali qual highly qualified experts, HQEs, you on the defense, others on the prosecution side, Three others. Three to one, but you call that a fair fight, I know. I do. Um, uh, I believe it. You're not shy. Um, <laughs> I think you all figure that one out. Um, uh, and the Army uh, and the Navy, and I believe the Air Force has as well, um, which is by definition an admission on their part that their people don't have the experience commensurate uh, with the civilian sector and that you can provide uh, professional uh, advice from the sidelines. Um, but you're not allowed to go to court. You're not allowed to litigate these cases. Um, could, you, could you share uh, with us any observations you've had in the few months you've been there, knowing that we're talking about you know, my colleagues, uh, other people who are in the military's colleagues. These are patriotic, hardworking, eager uh, defense counsel and prosecutors who want to do the best they can but they're forced, as you said, to rotate through this fairly quickly. Well, I've gone to court. I, I consult on cases. I get asked case-specific questions. I try to develop resources. But I go to court as much as I can to observe these young attorneys, and they're all children to me, um, practicing law. I mean, I, I am literally old enough to be their mother, and I've been practicing law longer than most of them have been alive. So having that, I come in and they're handling the most serious of cases, rapes, murders, really serious cases with really serious consequences for everybody in the room. And what I see is commitment, passion, dedication. I even see a great legal bearing in the courtroom, largely, I think, instilled in officer school, in military justice school. What I don't see is litigation skills. I, I recently, just this past week, went and watched a, uh, a case that was, had very serious consequences. It involved a, uh, an allegation of sexual assault by a gunnery sergeant select in the reserves. And um, what I saw was a passionately committed attorney who was accounted at the time to be one of the more highly skilled. He had 20 months of a litigation billet. But he was making new attorney mistakes that we beat out of our misdemeanor attorneys before they see the first felony. Things like arguing with a witness. Things like not being prepared uh, with the, and for those of you who are not lawyers, I'm going to apologize because it's technical, not being prepared to impeach appropriately. Um, not being able to, um, to step back from 
becoming so passionate that you can maintain your professionalism and an understanding physically just how to step back and take a breath so you're not engaged in what appears to be an argument with the witness. Look, I did it. Every new attorney does it. But by the time I was handling a rape case or a sexual assault case, I had had that beat out of me. And we don't actually have the time to do that. Some of our attorneys who are going to do 15 months, they may end up doing four contested courts, some ad administrative separation boards. Um, they may not even get four actual trials. And yet one of those trials may be a murder or a rape, and that is concerning. And, um, you know, uh, there's one of me, and I can't be in every courtroom, um, you know, critiquing every attorney at the end of it as much as I might want to. That's why we need experience, so that we can learn from our mistakes. And, and as we were discussing before the panel started, you know, I learned a lot more when I made a mistake than when I had a success. So. Yeah, I think that was uniform agreement among that. Anything you all want to say before we take the first question? No. Pat, Paul? All right, just raise your hand and our, our uh, colleagues will, raise, will uh, bring the microphone to you. Okay. Here we are in the front in the uh, blue-purple shirt. Yeah. I'm colorblind, so I can't tell the difference between the two. Hi, Danny Walsh from Senator Coates' office. You mentioned the lack of experience here. Do you think that there's an added role that our citizen soldiers, for example, the National Guard, could have to improve the age, the maturity issues that you're talking about here? Um, let me make an observation uh, as a judge, um, although I'm only here in my capacity as a heritage scholar but I was a teacher at the Justice School. We have, across all the services, uh, reservists. And there are reservists in this room, uh, some of whom are federal prosecutors, some of whom are federal public defenders, some of whom are state public defenders. Uh, and when they leave active duty, for whatever reason, and they go all of a sudden to a big city DA or public defender's office, and they go through their rotation doing misdemeanors, then they make their way up to more complicated misdemeanors, then low-level felonies, then preliminary hearing or grand jury, and make their way up the food chain like all of us did. Um, they bring an enormous amount of value um, uh, with them uh, to the armed services, to the courtroom, uh, if they act as a prosecutor or defense counsel. And by definition, I mean, if you look at, uh, your name's Danny? Right. Yeah. If you look in our report, we highlight publicly available information about the number of courts martial held, not tried, held by all the services for many, many years in the back in Appendix 2. Um, and of course, most cases held result in pleas, like in the civilian sector. The number is infinitesimal compared to the number, the volume of cases you would see pushed through any circuit court, superior court in most states, Indiana included, uh, which means less chance to try cases because fewer cases are coming across your desk. Um, and, and that means less trials for people who are there. And so um, National Guards, no different. Uh, they, if they are you know, civilian counsel, civilian prosecutor, civilian def defense counsel, pr public defender, they bring value as well. And the armed services, I think, have done a fairly good job um, looking to those skill sets across the services and plugging them back in their pillar. Um, it's not a perfect system, but I think you know, the, 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 the impact of the reserves and the National Guard has been very positive uh, in, in this solution. I don't know what your all's experiences are. Or, um, Kate, I don't know, you probably see reservists chop through Pendleton all the time. I do. I think that one of the, I think that reservists are value added in a lot of ways, um, but I think less in the active defense of an individual service member because you can't be a sporadic criminal defense attorney. Right. You need the sustained commitment for the length of the case. Now, the military justice system is designed to move faster than the civilian counterparts, but there are inevitably cases which take a long time. The case that I watched last week had been kicking around in one or more iteration, more charges being added, more being dismissed, back and forth for almost two years. 
You can't take a citizen soldier, a, a, a reservist or a National Guardsman, out of his life and say, here, do this for two years. So I think in the defense bar, we see them more. They come back as investigating officers at Article 32s. Some, we get a lot of reserve judges who come back and do a, you know, they drill for two weeks and will handle a couple of special court marshals, that kind of thing. And we also have reserve training officers. So our reservists come in and train our, uh, our active duty component. I just... I, was, I had to take the red eye last night because I was doing a training and the lead off trainer was a reserve lieutenant colonel who was talking about how to complete the discovery process effectively and he brought 20 years of criminal litigation to that and so they're very effective but not in the day-to-day -day representation of individual accused. So the career track is still a long-term improvement I think structurally, Danny, it has to be. Um, to Kate's point, you know, some reserve units are flex drillers, so they don't have to drill on the weekend, so they can drill during the week. So it's easier to, to uh, parachute in as a prosecutor, as a reservist, try a case or second seat a case or help with the investigation of a case because there's no attorney-client relationship necessary than it is to parachute in as a defense counsel because, you know, that is an expense of resources and a time commitment. But it's an excellent question. Other questions from the audience members? I know this gentleman in the, in the vest. Thank you so much. My name is Adam Cram. I'm a uh, student at American University Law. Um, and I was just wondering how the uh, career litigation track would affect uh, the ability for effective staff judge advocates uh, with respect to the Marine Corps doing operational law, doing a lot of other things. Would that have any impact at all? If you look um, at um, uh, the Navy, uh, career litigation track, which is still in its uh, infancy, five or six years old. In the instruction, which is footnoted in our paper, they have a model chart of a career track. And at, between the, at the commander level, which is 05, um, there's an opportunity to off-ramp from defense or trial counsel to become a staff judge advocate. A staff judge advocate, for those of you not in the military, is essentially the corporate counsel, the lawyer jag, who advises a convenient authority on a whole host of issues. Pat had them when he was a convenient authority. Um, everything from environmental law to personnel law to contract law, anything going on the base, and then, yes, a small portfolio of criminal law. Um, so, yeah, I think it makes sense. And, and think of it this way. Um, uh, um, the, the, the services without a career track Marine Corps, Army, Air Force right now. They'll put somebody like you who just graduated from law school or about to graduate and pass the bar, uh, go, to, go into the service. The first two, you may be defense counsel for two years, and you get really serious cases right out of the bat. You don't get the DUIs, the simple assaults, the, the simple uh, theft, petty theft. You just get whatever comes across your desk. You may have the good fortune then to go to the other side, but then you're going to go off to usually non-litigation billets environmental law, um, a deployment, you name it. Uh, maybe the 10, 12, 15 year mark, you may cycle back to be the senior defense counsel or the senior prosecutor, which means you haven't been in the courtroom for 10 years. In opposite to what Paul, Kate, Pat and I are envisioning uh, or what we're used to in the civilian side. Uh, and at some point you may become the SJA. How can you as the SJA, if you're creating a system out of scratch, be as competent as you should be in criminal law if you've been off the grid for 10 years. And so the Navy litigation track uh, has an opportunity for people to become SJAs. And by the way, the Navy litigation career track does not uh, specialize, force you to choose between prosecution and defense. You can toggle between the two your entire career. There's merit in that. I think there's more merit in keeping you in one or the other after the ability to try both early on. But people can disagree about that. But either way, you can stay in litigation your whole career in the, in the Navy and be promoted. Um, and I know we have some other folks in the room who may have experience with this. Neil, if you want to say anything, Neil Puckett is a distinguished uh, Marine lawyer and also an HQE. I don't want to put the spotlight on him, but I know he's a talkative guy. But you did anyway. Right. <laughs> um, well, uh, yes, Kelly, I, I've as a private practitioner, I retired from the Marine Corps uh, 
Judge Advocate Community in 1997 and, and entered private practice until I was recruited by the Navy to be their highly qualified expert in complex and sexual assault litigation, uh, Kate's counterpart in the Navy. Um, what, what I noticed in the services is pretty much what you said. Uh, there's, there's a lot of bouncing around that goes on. Uh, the Air Force seems to do a pretty good job, though, of uh, uh, training people uh, quite extensively extensively before they make them defense counsel. They'll let them be prosecutors, but not defense counsel until they've been certified at a certain level. But I do believe the Navy has taken the lead. Um, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Department of the Navy here, just as a private citizen, but uh, I think the, Na I. The, the Navy really is uh, taking the lead in trying to go in the direction you're going in, in professionalizing uh, military justice. And uh, I've seen just, I've, I've been in the job for a year, and I've seen uh, vast improvements uh, in the uh, resources devoted to training specifically on both sides, both prosecution and defense. Uh, we've set up a remarkable network uh, of, of um, and, and actually getting it funded for, for not only uh, in-house training, but also uh, privately sourced uh, training. And I think, I, I agree with, with almost everything that the, uh, that the panel has said here today. But what I, what I would ask uh, the panel members, uh, based on your experience both in the military and civilian community, how do you deal with a system that is designed to create uh, to, and bounces people around specifically in order to get them varied experiences so that they can later be uh, commanders and leaders at the senior level, at the uh, 05, 06, and 07 level uh, in communities. You can't do that if you've just been a defense counsel. You can't do that if you've just been a prosecutor. And so how are we going to meet the resistance the services are going to put up to developing stovepiped career tracks like this? Um. I'll address that a little bit, and not as a JAG and not as, as, a, as a prosecutor in the DA's office. I'll, I'll uh, address it as a naval officer and a helicopter pilot. Um, by the time I had 30 years in and I was an admiral, no one ever asked me how good a helicopter pilot I was. What I was about was managing resources, putting teams together, and completing a mission. Over the course of my career, I started out doing helicopters, but you start to develop subspecialties in certain areas that can take you further along in your career. So for example, I've done 31 promotions boards in the Navy, okay? And you in other words, you sat as a person yes, voting for people, files. getting promoted. And what I see in a lot of different career tracks in the Navy, and, and I won't talk about JAG, is that there are, uh, there's a certain path that you have to take, uh, become a department head, become a commanding officer, and move up the chain. But also, there's a subspecialty that you can develop that, for example, might require a master's degree. Okay, so the people that are working in the Pentagon right now dealing with the Navy budget, the 06s and 1 stars and 2 stars, those were pilots. However, they developed a, an expertise that the Navy invested in, say, uh, financial management at, at the postgraduate school. IT is another one. Uh, uh, a lot of the human resources people uh, at the large scale, the Bureau of Personnel people, are people that have done multiple tours. So what I'm getting at is what the JATs could perhaps look at is having multiple subspecialties that you could choose early on if you show a certain level of expertise in trials. And then as they go back and forth, they are still doing the things that will lead them to extra areas of responsibility and enhance them for promotion. But their main core thing is they were a trial lawyer or they were an international law lawyer. And, and that might be a way of, of doing it so that you promote expertise and also promote the people that also can move up the chain. Let me. Um uh, try to answer the question because it's a structural question that actually has been asked before and answered in the Navy. Uh, and this is the answer for the other services as well. Um, this is a trade-off. To become the Judge Advocate General of the Navy, Army, or Air Force, uh, if you look at the past JAGs, they call them the T-JAGs, you see a broad range of experience Everything from uh, uh, Echelon 1 uh, TICOM command posts where they're JAGs to uh, SJA to international and operational law billets to billets overseas, billets afloat, uh, billets in combat, etc. Uh, you want that for the Judge Advocate General and the Deputy Judge Advocate General. And what the Navy finally figured out is you know what? There's just some folks born to be trial lawyers. And they'd be willing to give up being the Judge Advocate General of the Navy or the Deputy Judge Advocate General of the Navy if they can stay in the courtroom. 
their thirst for the courtroom is greater than their thirst for a two-star or three-star billet. But to further enhance the ability to keep those people there, they did two things. One, they put precept language in promotion selection boards that said, you will select no fewer than X number of people in the military justice track for the next level. So lieutenant commander to commander, commander to captain. So that guarantees you if you're a superior performer, you're going to be competitive and you will be promoted up to captain. Secondly, they know that all litigators think they're brilliant. This, no one uh, doubts that, even from the panelists. And that they oftentimes want to become a judge because the capstone of a litigation career oftentimes is a judgeship. Sometimes it's the head prosecutor, sometimes it's the head defense counsel, sometimes it's a trial judge or an appellate judge. And so they created a tombstone billet, a billet where if you're the chief judge of the Navy, as an 06, the day you retire, you retire as a one star. So it still gives those hungry, bread to the bone litigators the chance to specialize, to be promoted, to have a viable career, and get to a star if they become the CJON, the chief judge of the Navy. That's how they did it. Precept language and incentivizing it and realizing it's a trade off. You're not going to become the JAG, but you may become the CJON and you can become a damn good litigator and stay in the courtroom your whole career. We have a question. Can I just speak yep, to that please. one issue? We're downsizing our forces, and the vast majority of our, our judge advocates that come into the military, they're not going to be career right. judge advocates. Um, they are patriots. They want to serve their country. They're committed to doing this work. But, you know, they may very well leave the military uh, and finish out in the reserves. And they may very well find, and, you know, the Marine Corps is committed to returning our Marines to civilian life better than we got them. And they may well find that the thing that is going to enhance their civilian career is not environmental law or advising a command authority, it's litigating. And so there may be people who are not career officers, but this will still be a career enhancing opportunity for them. So I did want to kind of mention that yep. because I think that it's important to understand that there are a lot of, I mean, we have right here an example of someone who left active duty and then continued a career in the reserves, but also had a very full civilian career. So I think it's important to recognize that that's something we want to allow for as well. We received a question online uh, uh, from Lieutenant Colonel Mark Revoir, United States Marine Corps. He's currently the senior military fellow at the Atlantic Council, and this is to the panel. One of the recommendations in the report was to increase training and guidance for service members on sexual assault prevention. The services have ramped up the training, the annual training on sexual assault prevention in recent years. Does the panel feel that the training that the services have provided up to this point is effective, insufficient, or both? Has the training to this point had any effect? Do you have any specific recommendations? I'm not familiar with all the training that they do. I think certainly prevention training is one part of a solution. And I think one of the problems with a lot of things we do is we don't have a good metric for measuring and really answering that type of question. How do you evaluate it? How do you gauge whether it's uh, successful or not? If it leads to, for example, less sexual assault. Now, sometimes you can look numbers over a greater period of time, but again, in this area, not every crime is reported to begin with. There's a lot of factors that make it very difficult, I think, to gauge, although I think it's a good question. But you may see some other impacts having dealt with it in the field. Pat? I can't speak to the other services. I can't speak to what I saw in the Navy. I retired a year ago. And the Navy, about two years ago, seemed to get very, very invested in this. They had always spoken about this. I think, and I'll just talk about the Navy, I think they've done a good start. However, I think they still have a ways to go. I think it is very, it's very uncomfortable to talk about sexual assault in a general context, but if you're going to talk about to 17, 18 year olds, what happens on Saturday night at 2 o'clock in the morning when you've had three beers in you, uh, I think it requires people that have a really good skill set at doing that, and I think the Navy is going in the right direction. They need to be able to have their supervisors down to the lowest level to be articulate in things like date rape, rehypnol. They need to be able to they need to be able to speak so that victims um, uh, that are in the command feel that the command will support them. 
I spoke openly as a prosecutor, although I was in uniform, in front of, at times, 500 people at Third Fleet about these issues, and I got get very graphic. Every time I spoke, I would have two or three sailors come up to me and say, I need to talk to you. Because it was the first time for some of them that they felt like there was someone that actually would sit down. And in and, and almost all the cases, they said, this happened years ago. I just need to tell someone it. They've never told anybody before. But I think if, if the Navy continues and the other service continue to bring people in that have, you talk about reservists with expertise and other things, bring people in that are, are, are conscious of what the victims go through, are conscious of these issues, I think we can, like I said, put up some of those barriers that'll, maybe we want to lower prosecutions, we want to stop these things, and I think that would be a good thing. Appendix A of our report also details um, publicly available reports of all general military training that the services have offered to all the people they've recruited and retained uh, over the years. I'm sure, I'm very confident that there's a lot more additional training that takes place. It's just not publicly available on websites. This gentleman in the front. And this will be our last question. Hi. Is it, on? it is. Hi, Casey Blake, Blake Learning Systems. We provide training uh, in this area. Um, one of the questions I have is, uh, while all sexual assault is egregious, it's especially egregious when it's higher up in the chain of command. And I think you, you've seen some high profile cases, and that's one of the reasons we're talking about this here today, specifically the Wilkerson case. Um, how, what recommendations do you have to, uh, uh, regarding, especially when, uh, when higher up in the chain of command will reverse a case like that, what specifically recommendations do you have from a legal standpoint? Yeah, we don't need to make one because Congress has taken care of that and so has the Secretary of Defense. The sec our UCMJ Article 60 um, is um, a rule that still exists but has been modified. It used to allow convening authorities to take action and require them to take action on court-martial convictions after the, the case was submitted and the person was found guilty. It allowed them to modify a sentence. It allowed them to, among other things, overturn a conviction if the convening authority thought that uh, the case wasn't proven beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the Wilkerson case. That is no longer going to happen because the SECDEF has changed the rule and the Congress is going to enact it into law. Uh, that is, uh, seems to have a lot ahead of steam, and that is not going to be uh, possible anymore. Remember, however, because we wrote an earlier paper about Article 60, the defense bar, and I was a defense counsel in the Navy and a prosecutor, so I lived dual lives like many JAGs. Um, Article 60 existed uh, at a time way before we had intermediate appellate courts where they took years or many, many months to act on a conviction. And so Article 60 gave a commander, a convening authority, the power to act on something where he saw manifest injustice or perhaps an un unfair sentence. If you read military appellate cases, and they come out all the time, most of them, the convening authority, takes some action on the sentence, either approves part of it, disapproves part of it, uh, and I expect that will probably continue unless Congress completely eliminates the ability of convening authority to act on any aspect of a sentence. But the Wilkerson scenario, overturning a conviction, that's not going to happen anymore. You'll have to wait for an appellate court to overturn a conviction. Kate, do you want to say anything? Since I think you probably have opinions about this. Well, Not I, that you're opinionated or anything. No. No, no, no one would say that about me. No. Um, I think that... Um, Part of the clemency uh, privilege is recognition that it is not a unanimous verdict. It is a very small number of panel members. In a uh, general court martial, as few as five jurors or five panel members can make a decision. In a special court martial, which, in which the penalty is limited, to, it's like a misdemeanor, to one year, as few as two of three panel members can make a decision. When we talk about convictions in the s civilian side, we're used to juries of 12, unanimous verdicts, and we're used to being able to pick the jury 
with a significant number of what are called preemptory challenges, which means that after we question the witness, the veneerman, we can say, in California, it's 10 challenges. Each side gets 10 challenges. So when we pick a jury, we call 44 people to begin with from the community, and we go through until we get 12, or and sometimes 14 if you have alternates. And if, if I could jump in, because we're sure. basically out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one of the uh, amendments uh, that will be considered, um, and I can't remember whether it's a House or Senate proposed amendment, uh, requires uh, an overview and study of the parole and clemency procedures within the military justice system to see whether uh, a radical modification of Article 60 or a minor modification of Article 60 or just eliminating the ability to overturn verdicts is sufficient. And so that, I suspect, will pass. Uh, it's always good to look at processes along the way, and I suspect that may be one of the, 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 the pieces of the legislation uh, that passes. Um, Will you all please join me in thanking the panelists for this excellent presentation. We are adjourned.